We're going to be bringing on our East Coast uh, correspondent. We're going to be talking about a number of different uh, issues and uh, whatnot. But um, before we do that, I wanted Dallas to pull up uh, some of these stories. Uh, the first one that we're going to talk about here is uh, the attacks that have gone on around the U United States uh, probed uh, linked to this game called Knockout. I don't know if you guys have heard about this game, but it says in New York, a 78-year-old woman strolling in her neighborhood was punched in the head by a stranger and tumbled to the ground. In Washington, a 32-year-old woman was swarmed by teenagers on bikes and one clocked her in the face. There's this phenomenon that's going, uh, going on throughout the whole country. It's this game called Knockout. And, uh, yeah, we just wanted to brief you on that first uh, before we brought on Sam because we're going to be uh, talking about that later. So uh, if we can, we're going to try to bring on uh, Sam here. I don't know why that's not showing up. Uh, Sam, can you hear us? Tony, I'm here. Hello, Minnesota. Hello. I'm having a little uh, issue uh, getting you up here. I don't know why. But well, Tony, I, that, that's okay because uh, let me tell you something. I I don't know how long I'm going to be here for. I've I've got to get to work tonight. What do you mean? Well, Tony, I um, you know I'm not, I I wasn't planning on moonlighting, but the strangest thing happened to me this morning. The U.S. Census Bureau showed up at my door. And they asked uh, about who lives here, and they asked me if I'm employed. And I actually, I thought that was pretty normal because in case the viewers don't know, it's actually the Census Bureau that their data is provided to the Labor Department to calculate the federal government's unemployment rate. Uh -huh. nationally. So I, I told the gentleman that I, that I am employed full time, but you know, the strangest thing, he had his little government notepad, and, and he said four full-time jobs. It was like he, he made up three people out of thin air and said they're all employed. Um, and then he hopped in his car with the hope and change bumper sticker and he took off. But I'm still pretty confused, Tony, because does that mean I'm working four jobs, 160 hours this week? Because if so, I'm going to have to go wait some tables tonight. I'm going to have to be out of here pretty soon. <laughs> well, Sam, that's a, that's a funny story to start us off. But unfortunately, it's not that far-fetched. It turns out that the Census Bureau did indeed fudge some of the numbers back in August and September of 2012. And if you remember, back then, the unemployment rate uh, was stubbornly above 8%. It was above 8% for pretty much the entire first term of the Obama presidency, uh, whereas uh, mysteriously in, in September they dug up some numbers and it went from 8.1% to 7.8%. And uh, there's been a lot of talk about, you know, whether this was something that was done intentionally because there's poll numbers that show when people sense that there's momentum in the economy, when there's a downward trend in unemployment, an upward trend in employment, that people feel optimistic and it tends to benefit the incumbent. And in this case, I don't know. What do you what do you make of all this, Sam? Do you think there was some foul play with the Census Bureau numbers, or do you think it was just an honest mistake? Well, Tony, remember uh, a U.S. Census Bureau worker has admitted to being told by higher ups. Uh, this was all in the news this week. That higher ups said, "Hey, you're not meeting your numbers. Just make things up." Um, this is documented and. And so I don't know, you know, foul play might not be the wrong, that might be the wrong way to describe it, but let's just say this. There's a recurring theme here by, by now, and here's how it goes. Someone in a government agency does something pretty shady, and you could make an argument that it could benefit the Obama administration, uh, in this case, fudging the numbers to possibly lower the unemployment rate when it had sat stubbornly above 8% for so long, and two months before the election, it, it drops drastically. But then the president and little Jay tell us, hey, we're shocked, we're outraged. We read this in the newspaper yesterday, like, like me and you, Tony. Um, so you'll have to excuse my sarcasm, but this sounds a whole lot like the IRS scandal. Um, and the Republican-controlled Congress will have a hearing and they'll investigate this. You and I have talked about, my opinion, how little those hearings actually do. So my prediction, and I'm not saying this is right, but my prediction is that we won't learn anything. This will go nowhere. The story is probably losing steam already. The Obama administration has shown they will give zero support or assistance to any investigation of their own federal agencies, which I think is sad because he campaigned on a very transparent government and, and we haven't had that. 
Um, but Tony, I do want to talk about unemployment with you because uh, let, let's talk about some good news. Uh, out there in Minnesota, statewide unemployment rate dropped to 4.8% compared to federally 7.3%. Is this cause for celebration? Well, yeah, I mean, I believe that it uh, definitely is uh, good news. Uh, of course, we wish that that rate was even lower. Uh, but, you know, for the most part, I feel like I work pretty closely, you know, on the ground level of the economy, doing my business in the mortgage business. I'm constantly taking applications and getting pictures of people's financial situations. And I have to say that it does appear that uh, people are becoming more employed. They are starting to make a little more money. Uh, they're getting equity back in their house. So I take all of this news uh, pretty greatly. And, and especially if you have an employer or if you're lucky enough to be employed where, the, where the, your employer takes care of your insurance so that you don't have to get sent into the Mincher exchange because uh, the, the numbers came out and, and Minnesota actually is in the top 15 of the states for the highest deductible. So for people that are employed, that are covered by their health insurance by their employers, good news. For those that are uh, left with Mincher, I'd say you're going to have to be spending a lot more on your health care in these next, next coming years. Tony, there were some statistics published last week regarding deductibles from health care exchanges across those 15 different states that you mentioned. It mm -hmm. was uh, the consultancy group is called the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation, and they did this study, and they concluded, and I'll, I'll actually qu quote from here, the health plans offered on Minnesota's online insurance marketplace have the highest deductibles of those 15 states studied. Tony, this, uh, this consulting group determined the average annual deductible for a Minsure plan is $4,061. $4, that's more, to put it, this in uh, perspective, that's more than twice the deductible for comparable plans in states like Massachusetts wow. and Maine that were also studied. Exactly. Um, now, Tony, on the flip side, this is apparently kept premiums very low in Minnesota on Minsure. But I've got to say, if you're coughing up four grand a year for the first $4,000 of medical expenses, the premium should basically be zero, right? And I'm afraid this is a sign of bad news today for Minnesotans, but bad news tomorrow for everyone. Tony, this study goes on. These trends towards high deductibles, this won't just impact um, the, the people that have to join federal or state exchanges. Even if you have private coverage, those deductibles are rising rapidly too. We have the statistics to see that. Uh, you made our, our, our normal Nancy Pelosi joke that we need to pass <laughs> it and then find out what it's going to do. We're seeing this. This is real. People are affected. And, and Tony, I want to say, even your governor, uh, Mr. Mark Dayton, he must have seen this coming because apparently he was too busy saving last year to donate any money to charity. Tony, did you see the governor's tax return? <laughs> Sam, Governor Dayton, he did release his uh, tax return just recently, and maybe he was pretty concerned uh, to saving every last dime to pay his Mincher deductibles because the news stated he only managed to donate about $1,000 in his last return, and it's pretty notable because the governor makes uh, well over $300,000 a year and he was only able to muster up a, a $1,000 a donation. And he was pressed on this, and it made news in Star Tribune, Pioneer Press, Mincher, and some others. Uh, so they're definitely reporting on this. And, and to give uh, Governor Dayton credit, he did come out and, and say that he was disappointed in himself in terms of his lack of giving. And he has given in the past you know, more than he did this particular year. He has acknowledged it. Uh, you know, Governor Dayton did say he's disappointed himself and that he only donated $1,000 to charity. So hopefully in the future he's going to be uh, donating more. Uh, Tony, I, um, I, I want to say that Governor Dayton is certainly not obligated to donate any set amount or percentage of his earnings to charity. No, no, governor, no governor or public you know, servant is. We live in a free society. Governor Dayton and any elected official should have the right to save, donate, whatever they want. Um, but I did some research, some official Tony Hernandez show research and some numbers for the, for the show today. So I, I did two main points I want to make. I did find it a little odd that in 2009 when he was candidate Dayton, he found a way to donate $27,000 to charity in a single year, uh, whereas the past two tax years combined, it's about $3,000. So. We'll have to let the viewers of the show um, 
make their own conclusions there. Uh, second point, donate whatever you want to charity. Tony, you do it, I do it, um, we do whatever we can, uh, whether it's charities we like or through a, a church or, or any organization we're familiar with. So whether you're the governor or whether you make a tiny fraction of what the governor makes, donate what you're comfortable donating. But you better be be real careful about the paying your fair share line if you don't practice what you preach a hundred percent of the time. Um, I, I think it's really unfair from the left we get this pay your fair share, pay your fair share and then sometimes they're not exactly doing that themselves so uh, so Governor Dayton, we'll, we'll see, hopefully he uh, hopefully he donates a little more this year but Tony I understand uh, Governor Dayton up for re-election next year and he's already got a lot of possible uh, Republican challengers and one more jumped in into the race this week. Tony, you've been around Minnesota politics for a while now. What can you tell the viewers of the show about Marty Seifert? Yeah, well, Mar Marty, uh, Marty Seifert, he uh, jumped into the race uh, last week. He made his announcement. He's been on a tour uh, throughout the state of Minnesota. I know he was flying around in a little, uh, a little jet uh, doing his uh, media tour and going out and meeting the folks. Uh, Marty's a great guy. We hope that uh, we're going to be able to have him on the show in the next upcoming weeks so that we can hear more from him about his ideas. He did run in 2010 for the Republican endorsement. He wanted to run against uh, run that year for governor, and he did not get the Republican endorsement. Uh, Tom Emmer did, and uh, he went into the private sector, worked for a while, and, and now he decided that he's going to uh, he wants to run in 2014. As you stated, there is a uh, there's a growing field of very very strong uh, Republican candidates that uh, want to run against uh, Dayton or whoever the DFL uh, candidate's going to be in 2014. So I take that all as, as a good sign, and I take it as a sign that uh, Mark Dayton is vulnerable. You can just read in publications like the City Pages and, and other very left-leaning uh, publications, and they're coming down on Mark Dayton, whether it's for uh, his donations or lack of donations, whether it's for... Uh, some of his, uh, um, you know, things with his upbringing that, you know, we, we read it and we realize that he's weak. And so it's pretty great that we have uh, people stepping up that want to run. Um, there's rumors that Governor Dayton may not even run in 2014, that somebody else uh, may be running. Uh, that remains to be seen. But Marty, uh, Marty's a strong guy. We had Senator Dave Thompson. He's also running. He was, he was on the show uh, two weeks ago. Of course, we had Commissioner uh, Jeff Johnson, who uh, won the straw poll. He was number one at the Republican State Central straw poll. Uh, Jeff Johnson was the number one contender. State Senator Dave Thompson was number two. And I believe that uh, Marty Seifert, even though he hadn't declared yet, he was actually uh, finished in number three in that straw poll. And that really encouraged him to, to step up and, and decide to run. So I think that the bottom line of it all is that the governor's seat is uh, very much in play in 2014 and the right candidate if the right candidate can win the endorsement and also win the primary i believe that that will be the formula needed in order to uh, get that majority of minnesota voters uh, for a new governor so we'll see um, you know and there's some other people i know uh, representative kurt zellers uh, he's running and uh, there's a, a Scott Honor, who's a, a businessman who doesn't have any, he's never held political office, but he, he's very successful in the private sector. Uh, we've played a video uh, from his campaign at one point. Uh, he's running. So there's a, there's a strong field. And the one worry that I have, and uh, Chris Dahlberg, who's running for the U.S. Senate, we talked about it a little bit, is the state of uh, unity or lack of, of unity uh, within the uh, Republican Party right now. There's a lot of divisions, especially here in Minnesota, because you have this strong Ron Paul faction. Uh, there's a lot of Ron Paul libertarian uh, supporters, and they almost run exact opposite to uh, the so-called neoconservatives or uh, the more kind of traditional big government Republicans. Uh, they, they run uh, head in head. And then you have these different camps uh, within the, the, the governor's race, all running for this governor's endorsement. And so the threat is, is that 
there's going to be too much division and too much of, of people beating each other up that at the end of the day, uh, the Republican Party or the Republican candidate is going to be weakened uh, by all of this. So, uh, you know, that's why I think that the, the most crucial aspect is whoever wins the endorsement has to win the primary and then they will win the general election. If a Republican candidate wins the endorsement and loses the primary to another uh, Republican who uh, dismissed the endorsement process and continued to run into the primary, we're going to run into issues and it could mean that it would be a, a landslide victory for uh, either Governor Dayton or whoever the uh, DFL the DFLer is. So it, a lot's going to be shown over this next year, there's no doubt. Tony, uh, I, I, I need a quick on-air clarification from, from you, the host of this great show. Did What's you that? just say if, a if one of these Republicans can get the party endorsement and win the primary, you predict them to go on to win the general election? I do. I do. I think oh, that, uh, yeah, because it's going to be all about unity. And if conservatives and independents and then the, the Republicans, uh, if they can form a coalition this year to uh, really promote new leadership, effective leadership, and, uh, you know, somebody who's going to be in there and be a strong leader, I, I think that that will be the case. Ultimately, we'll see a Republican win in 2014. Well, you're right about the division uh, within your state and on, and on a federal level, both. I remember, Tony, last, uh, yeah, it was last summer, uh, or no, a year ago, I'm sorry, 2012 summer, when, when the Republican convention was taking place, and, and you had told me off the air about the Ron Paul supporters. I uh, made sure to run to a TV, to, to leave work for a few minutes, run to a TV uh, that afternoon to see Minnesota announce um, how the delegates, have, the delegates have voted. And the Ron Paul contingency in your state, they sure made a show of making sure that everyone understood that they were there. Um, so, and I, and I assume that that hasn't changed. So I think Minnesota GOP certainly has some challenges ahead of itself. Yeah, I mean, it, it, that part hasn't changed. And, it, and it, at least from what I observe, and, and I don't know so much because I'm not much of an insider uh, in terms of the party and stuff, but from what I can observe is there's a, still a lot of inner party battling going on. There's a struggle of identity. Uh, there's even a struggle on uh, some of the issues. You know, there's 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 not a huge consensus on on some of the main policy issues or planks of the party. Uh, and what the Democrats do so good, what they're so good at, is uniting the anti-Republican front. And that's essentially how they win their campaigns. It's essentially uh, how they have held the majority in this state. Is they run strict anti. Uh, Republican uh, messaging and, and campaigns and it's been effective because Republicans have not been able to unite to be anti-Democrat and uh, I think that you know if that hurdle can be jumped and if there can be unity built we'll, we'll, we'll see some differences but speaking of that Sam I don't know if you can see him in my face I was outside for a good uh, three hours earlier today I went to the TCF Stadium to uh, go meet with some friends that were doing some tailgating and, and uh, tailgate partying before the Badger Gopher game. Do you have any updates on, on the game right now? Or, are Gophers winning or are the Badgers winning? Tony, uh, right when I came on was halftime. Second half was starting, and Wisconsin had a, a slim 13-7 to 7 halftime lead. Uh, I'll have to see if I can get an update here uh, live on the air in a few seconds. They're at a commercial break right now, actually, mm -hmm. so I'll have an update shortly. <laughs> Uh, Tony, this is a big time game. First time in many years that Wisconsin, the Badgers, and, and your hometown Minnesota Golden Gophers come into the game both ranked in the top 25 as, as nationally ranked collegiate programs. Uh, they're playing for the Paul Bunyan's Axe, and, th and this is a big time game. First half, very low scoring, defensive struggle. Minnesota actually scored their touchdown in the first half on an interception return uh, for, for the pick six. So uh, we'll see. Oh, we just TV. How about you? Yeah, we, we you cut off there a little, Sam. I didn't uh, I didn't hear what you were saying there. But um, do you guys uh, do you guys have that game out there out east? Uh, the knockout game 
Are, are the kids playing that in Syracuse? Because I know they're playing it in, in New Jersey and they're playing it in, in Brooklyn and in certain areas. Are you familiar with that game, Sam? It, well, I guess we'll, we'll transition from a, a good game on the gridiron to this game that's taking place on the streets and at, at an alarming level. And it's in the news and, and maybe not right here in Syracuse, which is a smaller city upstate, but certainly down in New York and in New Jersey. We've heard about these elderly people, uh, Orthodox Jewish men, being targeted on the street by gangs, essentially, or, or, or groups of young men. And knockout is, is, I guess the way I understand it, is that the goal of this game is to knock out a person unconscious, if possible, with a, with a single blow, some unsuspecting pedestrian. Uh, it's taking place down in, in Washington, D.C. as well. Tony, this is a new story. Uh, I don't know where it goes. We're going to have to follow this for a couple of weeks and see how much of a problem in our, in our urban centers this is. Yeah, well, we'll uh, we'll we'll play some uh, we'll play a clip right now, uh, Dallas. If you can line this up, this is something that uh, I found online. But we begin with a 78-year-old woman walking in Midwood, randomly punched in the head. It may be the latest in a string of random assaults in the area. News 12's Kenneth Vernon spoke to the victim's family and has the latest. A scary attack on a grandmother in Midwood. She says a young African-American man punched her for no reason. The suspect didn't steal anything and left. The woman was too shaken up to speak to us on camera, but her daughter agreed to talk to us if we concealed her identity. Unimaginable that there are people who think that it's fun to hurt another human being. The victim's daughter tells us her 78-year-old mother was coming home after shopping in Manhattan. She was walking right along here on East 5th Street and Avenue L when a man walked up to her, said nothing, hit her in the head, and then took off. The attack happened on November 9th. The woman's family says she was too scared to report the incident until now because the family believes this is part of a knockout game. I feel that this was done by someone who intentionally wanted to hurt another person. Some people in the area feel that this is part of a rash of assaults that targets the Jewish community. This is uh, outrageous and ridiculous. I mean, there's been texts in this neighborhood all the time. This surveillance video shows a 20-year-old Jewish man being punched on November 10th. And just a few days before that, police confirm a 12-year-old boy was attacked by two African-American men. It is beyond comprehension, it is unacceptable, and we need to get the bad guys. The family asks anyone who's also been attacked to come forward and contact police to try to catch the people responsible. So Sam, I mean, that shows, uh, gives a little bit of a background of, of the story here. And I mean, I'm apparently this game has been around for a while. Uh, yeah. You know, I haven't heard of it really until, until recently. Um, but you know, I find it uh, something. Uh, I, I find it a bit, um, a bit disturbing. Don't you? Sure, it's it's disturbing in the very least, but it's actually very alarming. We're going to learn more about it, Tony. I want to point out that over the course of the week, a lot of conservative commentators were complaining about Al Sharpton and/or Jesse Jackson not speaking out about this. And to his credit, Reverend Sharpton today said, hey, if young, young or old uh, black people, African Americans, were being targeted for this, for this, um, this violence, they'd be speaking out about it. And he said it, it's, to his credit, he said, this is wrong for any group to be targeted and to be the victim of this senseless violence yeah and you know my feeling is throw the books at at whoever these kids are that are doing this it's uh it's unacceptable and you know if they're old enough to think that this is funny and if they're old enough to think that punching an old woman uh is some uh, some form of displaying a uh, toughness or masculinity throw the books at these kids i, I have I, no I, issues with that and it, you know it's something too i wanted to uh, we're not going to have time to talk about it but a, a, in a future show i think it would be interesting um because you know this idea in these cases the idea of hate crime you know comes up and there's a lot of people and, and some conservatives some liberals but they're against this idea of, of hate crimes and you know when you see people who are uh, allegedly being specifically targeted because of either their race 
or their religion, you know, in this case, the Orthodox Jews, or uh, because of sexual orientation. Um, I'm beginning to, to see more and more the validity of, of some of these types of laws that specifically, you know, go after these types of crimes. And do you think that this is a, a, an instance of, of a hate crime, Sam? And do you think that it should be dealt with uh, as such? Uh, I don't disagree with you that that hate crime legislation is not all bad. Uh, in this particular instance, I think we're going to need to follow the story and get more information before we say that necessarily. Um, one thing I want to add, I know we're running very short on time. Several weeks ago, Johnny Howard, on the candidate who was on your show, he said, we've got young men doing bad things in this country. And he said the problem is they don't have programs, they don't have jobs, I'm not a big government guy, but I think when these kids have nothing to do and nothing to keep them engaged, they're up to bad things. Yep. And, I, and I remember Johnny Howard's words, we've got kids doing bad things, we've got to get them in programs. Yeah, I mean, so. to, to a certain degree, uh, I would agree with that, but I think probably the, the main factor that's missing uh, it, with these kids that are doing this is probably the parents. Sure. Uh, my guess is, is that if somebody thinks it's, fun and entertaining to go out there and, and punch old women, old men, people who are unsuspecting to sucker punch them. My guess is that they don't have parents that are present and guiding them, disciplining them, loving them, uh, all those types of things. What do you think, Sam? Yeah, the, we, uh, as a society, we need more families. We need more parental involvement. Um, and sure, if, if kids aren't getting that as adolescents and preteens and teenagers, then uh, then we've seen what happens when when it's you know if you're 13 and 19 and 20 year old kids are providing that rather than your parents, then the results can can be pretty disastrous. Yeah, there's no doubt about that, Sam. And we're coming uh, to the end of our time here, and uh, I'd like to thank everybody for tuning in again to the Tony Hernandez Show. We broadcast live every Saturday from 4 o'clock to 5 o'clock at SCC Television Studios in White Bear Lake. We also replay on our YouTube channel, Tony Hernandez Show. Thank you all for tuning in. May God bless you. May God bless America. And vaya con Dios. And go Badgers.